the amount of times I, I lose count of how many times I've seen you guys perform and every time it's a different experience. But one thing holds incredibly true to every single show is the, the, the moment Junk walks out into the circle, everyone just looks up and thinks, oh, oh fuck. Do you know what? It's, it's what I always found was, I find this quite amusing, actually. And it's the funny thing is, when I first started breaking, I was I was a bit gutted that I was big. I said, like, oh, we don't want to be one of these small guys because you know, they, they find it so much easier. Well, actually, I got to learn to appreciate being big because it, mm. it was more shocking for people that I was a big, because not many breakers are bigger than me or even my size and, and still good. There are very, very few. Most of them are, are small. And um, but I'd come out and people were like, first of all, they're like, what the fuck's this guy going to do? Yeah, totally. like, Who is this bloke? You know what I mean? And it was almost like they were almost kind of intrigued as to like, because I didn't look like a typical breaker, being right. the size that I am. Um, and then I'd come out and smash it. I remember at the Urban Games, it was like, I mean, even a guy that I know said this because he was in the audience when he first saw me. And he goes, I saw you come out. And he's like, who's this guy? What's he going to do? Streetculturetv.com And we're here to talk about world music and street culture. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller, once again, live and direct, Central London, transmitting live for your sins. Big shout out to the sharers and carers. We're doing it for, you know, our hells. We're doing it for the sport. We're doing it for the coverage, the documentation, the archiving. Um, Get yourselves ready for the upcoming Hoddle Wars. It's time to graph punks up and get up with some NFT gaming. Also, big shout out to Chief Rocker Gear from streets to stage. Chief Rocker is the streetwear of champions. Big shout out to everyone who's got the Calavision app. Everybody, you know the deal. If it's uh, if it's not on your phone, then there's a problem. Free download, iPhone, Android, uh, for your street culture activities and all the bits in between. Uh, we are going over to Bournemouth to, to really uh, uh, express the gravity of this gentleman that we've got on today. Uh, it, it's really hard to put into context when himself and his crew dominated and to a larger extent still do in the history books as being one of the seminal breakdance crews of the UK. Um, unquestionable um, competitors in the sport from early. When you lot weren't breakdancing, these boys were breakdancing and they were innovating, pushing new levels and this one particular character um, rarely spoken um, but an absolute beast on the floor is here to join us. We're going to have a good chat about seconds and done. Hold tight. The master. Junk inside the place. How are you, my brother? I'm good. H hello. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, they say never meet your heroes. Well, we're here. We've jumped straight in. Kells is fanboying all in the pool. Um, how's it going? How are you? I'm very well. Yes. I'm in good health, good spirits, everything going okay still very active in the um in the b-boy and music and everything else djing so yeah all good yeah. thanks we can see uh in the background you know we had a little brief chat before we jumped in there do you know the paraphernalia of uh of culture and uh, hip hop and the the immersiveness it drags you in doesn't it and uh you you also dj you produce you you're an avid fan and collector in your own right right yeah Yes, yeah, so I've got a lot of stuff kicking around here. I've got pieces of music equipment that I've had for years, hunt well, thousands of records. Um, I've got bits of graffiti, photos. I've even got books, you know, like um, I've got that new graffiti book that I'm in, um, things like that. So there's all kinds of stuff related to kind of the, the my hip-hop career, as it were, or my music career, whatever it is, breaking career, all kinds of stuff I've got kicking around you know i've even got would you believe this oh hang on have we lost it no, i've even in. got b-boy birthday card from my mother there you go that really tops it up does it can you see that a b-boy they think of card. it all don't they <laughs> so i've got two of those and look at this one even just to top it off a dj card birthday card from my girlfriend can you see that it's the monty python the Black Knight, tis but a scratch, but he's on the deck. So there you go. 
Incredible. Um, Are we suggesting, uh, is there a suggestion it was your birthday recently? Uh, it was, yes, um, October. Um, so about a month ago, um, 54 now. Yeah, and she'll break in. So 40 years in the game, nearly. I'm not surprised that it, of any age, the, the, the life and soul of a creative, it, it, it's, it's hard to wean off, right? I think what most people, and me especially, in, also talking to Tony Pencil, big shout out to Tony, it's the relentlessness, I think, as a, as a crew and a collective, you know, even in the, the, the darker days, shall we say, um, of, the, of the 90s, um, you just never, you never st- stopped. It, it, it's so admirable. Do you know what I mean that it that it, it immersed you guys so much that you 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 pretty much turned your back on the UK and I don't I, I say that affectionately you were loved and of course it will never it never it never was the case but for want of a better term you just kept going. Well, we we um I didn't see the sense in this whole idea that in the late eighties or oh, you had to give up breaking everyone sort of gave up like because everyone else did and it's like half the people didn't even want to give up but they felt pressured to for some reason mm. like it wasn't the done thing anymore and in a way it's when you've got that kind of mentality you almost want to go against it it's like what it's if everyone jumps off a cliff you're going to do it too it's it's that kind of thing <laughs> where and it's almost like people kind of ostracized us and uh, were you still breaking and questioned it and didn't understand it well my attitude was and i think this is the attitude of the rest of the crew one we loved it for you know we love breaking that's what we did and the other thing is it's like well I've trained really hard for for four or five years to get good. Why should I give it up now? I'm just hit my peak, you know. I wanted to be really good at this from, from when I was, you know, nineteen eighty four onwards and trained like crazy. I wasn't a natural. It was hard for me being big. And by that sort of late eighties, I was getting quite good. And I was thinking, well, why don't I give up now? I've just got it all. You know, <laughs> this is crazy. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we didn't really turn up back in the UK. I mean, we still were kind of active in England during that time, but there wasn't much on accepted breaking you know there wasn't um there was the old jams that would we'd go to people would invite us where there was a bit of a breaking circle going on not, not many breakers and but the, a lot of stuff it was like kind of um people didn't want to really want to know around that time you know i remember we'd go to clubs or stuff like that in, in kind of like late 80s early 90s and people just kind of take the piss really you know and um so we just thought well we'll just go where we kind of loved and we we, we went to Europe a lot in the early 90s and there was a, big, a lot of stuff going on there they never gave up for some reason the, the Europeans when when we told them oh you know everyone stopped breaking in England they were like, well, why did they stop breaking they couldn't understand because in Europe it was really big so we used to go out there quite a lot you know Germany um, Switzerland uh, other places all through the early 90s and we met up with a lot of people like Storm and Swift and um, Maurizio and, and all these other people that were really good you know, it's, it's just a really mad scene. But we still used to be active in, in England. We noticed then by about mid-90s that, that the England thing was starting to re-emerge, sort of mid-90s onwards. And then mm. the so it kind of went for a lull, about six years, I would say. 88 to 94 was about that kind of lull, you yeah. know. But um, a few people carried carried on through, but wasn't, you know, we'd go to jams, we'd be the only ones breaking there. So, yeah, but just don't understand why, the, why everyone had to give up. You know, it's like, oh... Oh no, we don't do that anymore. We're into New Jack Swing. It's like, well, why? It was, was the, you know, there's a difference. You know, you still dance to you dance to music, right? Exactly. If you like something, do you know what it is? It's all this idea that something's out or in or cool or uncool. I, I think that's a ridiculous mentality. Do what you like. If you like Morris dancing, go and do Morris dancing. Do whatever it is. Don't care what other people think. Just just do it. It's if that's what you want to do, and that's how we found about breaking. Breaking wasn't kind of considered like. I don't know, in vogue at, at the late 80s, everyone's like, oh, that's old hat, that's out, you know, that's well, it's what I like doing, so I don't give a fuck what you think, you know. So mm. that that was basically it. But so we carried on, we did. I think that's I think this is gonna be the running sentiment of the podcast. Do you and do it, do it right. Um honor. Honorable, is it? Uh and you said ostracized, which um that's a that's a a very a, a very um calculative word there i i i remember very vividly the tone in which you know some out of the way clubs slowly started bringing breaking back in and to a lot of 
I guess people my age at the time, which I also found bizarre, is, you know, after a couple of pints, next thing they're doing the funky worm in front of you, and you guys were clearly cut above all of that kind of malarkey. Um, yeah. It, it, it was almost like they had never seen it, ever. It was. Do you know what? It was like that. Because when, say, like around the late 90s, we noticed that it come really fashionable for some reason. You had this um, Jason Nevins video, One Doom Sits Like That, with Breaking mm -hmm. In It, other music videos. It was kind of sort of like a big thing for some reason. And But I, I also think that, like you with those clubs, a lot of the people there were too young to really know about the, the first wave in the mid eight, early to mid 80s. Mm. So they, they kind of missed out on that. And they didn't really understand. A lot of them, yeah, so, some of them were seeing it for the first time. And maybe you had a few older people where it was a nostalgia thing and drunk blokes getting on the floor. We used to find them really annoying, to be honest. Um, of course. Where, <laughs> so did we. <laughs> all the go on, have a go and they're sort of just half killing themselves, you know, mm. uh, that kind of thing. But we noticed there was, there was we noticed in towards 95 onwards there was a different attitude towards it where it wasn't so much like the ostracization had gone and it was sort of like oh wow what's this this is like this is amazing but also we'd been training a good 12 13 years by that time solid so we were absolutely by late 90s we were shit hot so yeah. the standard that we were people couldn't believe how good we were because if you think like when we first saw beach street you know the Roxy battle like they were good for mm -hmm. the time but we were way we were way ahead of that, you know, that standard, what way they were doing then, and that was amazing then. So you may imagine seeing like the stuff that we were doing, like flares or continuous head spins or really mm. fast, you know, everything's really fast and furious, and people were like blown away with with how good we were because you know we'd been tr we'd trained like athletes for years, and they were like, "Fuck me, you're not a mental." So we we had a lot of that. So uh, we noticed a completely different attitude towards it though from. 97 onwards 98 you know and we did we did all the sort of jams and other events and we did things on tv and music videos and it just it kind of like there was this sudden interest in it and it we rode that way because we just like okay you want to pay us to dance fine yeah we, we're there you know that's how we do we made it a kind of a semi-career i'd say it was pretty, pretty much was a career for a while yeah a while. i'd say so i yeah, certainly we were, would say so almost like a professional dance outfit. We were doing like multiple gigs each week and it was great. It was great fun, you know, quite grueling sometimes, but we loved it. So, but definitely a different attitude to what was around, what was say five or six years before. Yeah, absolutely. Let's stay on that subject for a second because as, as a, a young killer Kells that barely beatboxed on the mic, I was just going, I was going down there because I wanted to experience the whole ensemble. And there were, uh, different characters with the different genres within uh, hip hop. The almost it, it it almost sent a signal that um, get on the ride, guys. The the surf the surf is coming. The wave is on its way. People like scratch perverts. People like yourselves that had had been you know comfortably incubating ideas, processing, building. I ideological um scenarios where you know the club would be rammed and you know hip hop is um being uh promoted in in all of its elements um and you know you've got to hand it to you know the the more kind of club eros based play big shout out to all the you know the the original promoters that saw the vision um but i think i think for the the core audience what we were seeing was our own that had always been there suddenly coming to life. Do you know what I mean? It's true. It was, we'd always been around, you know, the other people that were sort of, I don't know, you mentioned scratch perverts. Well, they were always about, you know, uh, it, all of a sudden this stuff was more popular. That's what it was. It was, it wasn't, we changed. It was the attitude and the popularity that the level of appreciation with the public had changed. That's what it was. And, and we found, we kind of broke into more mainstream kind of clubs as well, where it wasn't just like the, the underground hip hop clubs that were booking us to, to um, do gigs. Mm. We were getting booked for raves. We were getting booked for sort of mainstream type places, you know, that kind of stuff. It was, um, it, you know, corporate sort of stuff, you know, these parties, all kinds of stuff, really. It was like the novelty thing was to have a break dance crew, you know, turn mm. up and bust in a circle at your, your event. And so, yeah, we just enjoyed it. It's like, yeah, 
we're, we're happy to just happy to dance and go to these places and do it really but yeah definitely def, different level of appreciation though with um 15 years on from from the original 84 wave we would say with break dance beach street that kind of thing the electro albums when everyone started doing it to then late 90s you know where the dance had evolved of course so we were much better um but then people's attitudes it was like wow this you lot are amazing you know we used to get it all the time so that was definitely the change but yeah we were always around scratch purpose always around there's a host host of other djs and breakers and other people have always done their thing but just now we were getting more noticed mm, very much so um and attitudes because i guess stepping away being in in your own uh environments to create new moves come up with new ideas share them outside of the uk um i don't know without getting too dark on our own here you know the the brits can be quite self-loathing at best of time i don't think they even realized that they had such a high level of talent I, I would imagine going back coming back into those club environments you know post rave uh, and a and more open-minded audience to to, to at least the, the soundtrack that you guys would play that must have been quite at times shell shocking you know the reality of okay you don't know any of this <laughs> Yeah, we we noticed. Um, yeah, people just accepted it more. The breaking, the music, um, it almost came like a bit of a craze. I think, like mm. late nineties, where it was like everyone wanted a piece of it. I think it. I think that Jason Nevins video really blew it up. You know, that it's like that because that although that's a hip hop record, it was a house track really, and that hit really big mainstream. You know, and that video was everywhere. So we noticed then people were kind of like more. You had the big beat thing the big beat music genre kind of yeah. got big you know which is norman cook kind of with hip-hop beats over pop pop kind of melodies or whatever rock and roll whatever that that wasn't really our thing but people kind of confused that with the b-boy thing you know because of the breakbeat element so in a way that kind of um kind of pushed it forward you know we used to get booked to dance at big beat kind of events you know that kind of mm. thing so and even even um, the records that I was releasing around that time, the sort of b boy music that was selling, kind of on the back of the big beat hop. So the whole thing was like a big craze. It was almost like a big sort of wave where, yeah, breaking's cool. You got this music coming out, this new um, type of music. Uh, every, the whole culture, everything's kind of blown up, and you got these kind of funky clubs where it's a bit bohemian, you know, in London places like where where it's like coolest thing is to have a load of b boys turn up, you know mm. that. That, that so we noticed a lot of that and it went on as well not it wasn't just like a year it it really went on for quite a while where um we've been noticing we were doing a lot of gigs in the early 2000s you know and it was almost like we're questioning it how long is this going to go on for you know how long are we going to get keep getting these bookings and how long are we going to keep being so appreciated and it did really go on for a lot longer than we thought so it we really went on with it all through the 2000s you know and, and onwards yeah, and we still do things now, now, now and then. I mean, I mean, we're we're now hitting a fit in mid fifties, so therefore we're not really quite as active as fit as we were. But we did um, a big festival back in um, August in Dorset called We Out Here, which is a huge kind of dance. Well, it's really jazz and various forms of dance music based upon jazz. Um, and we did a breaking show there, and I did DJing as well, so it was mad, and people loved it. You know, yeah. That's incredible. So we are still there, and and there still seems to be a lot of interest in it as well. Yeah, I think now. that I, I get you. I get where you're coming from. It's particularly, you know, my introduction to to my career. I guess it, it all, you know, you'd have like like you said, Fat Boy Slim. I remember doing shows with him and Derek Delage and DJ Punk Rock and these names. Yeah, you know, you remember, right? Yeah. And um, they were almost like early adoptees of um, the the attitude the visual the visual attitude of the music that they were creating and through that i i, I don't know i guess the figureheads um of, of the uk hip hop scene saw the relevance in it and recognized that the promoters were seeing a correlation between the breakbeat world and actually the real true core essence of hip hop i remember seeing you yeah. guys man yeah. Absolutely, you, you guys, 
barely spoke. You kind of, you just walked out like absolute fucking weapons. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good description. We were, I tell you, we were that time. We were so fit. I mean, we trained so hard and we were just in top form and we just exploded on, you know, when we got to that floor, we just exploded. It was mental. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. And immensely fucking inspiring, man. Um, it was, it was around that time that, and now, you know, we're moving into like 99, you know, we're talking fresh 90, 98, we're talking and onwards. Essential Festival, you know, Concord 2, you know, the list can go on of these amazing events Scratch that were put on Club. independently, right? Scratch Club was one, Breaking Bread, mm. Funkin' Pussy. There was a lot of things going on that were kind of on that whole tip when that funk, hip hop, beat breakbeat music in general, whatever, that was that whole scene, wasn't it? You know, we did a lot of the, all these different nights. So after them, I can't remember the names of them, um, mm. where on the theme, it was hip hop, funk, you know, a lot of funk as well, played um, beat, breakbeat music, whatever you want to describe that as, big beat or b-boy music, whatever, that kind of whole thing going on, yeah. It was almost like, particularly the independent promoters, um, wanted to take own take ownership of okay we had the breakbeat thing going on i certainly did i certainly saw that um hip hop the, the clubs were having to work to what the culture demanded do you know what i mean yeah i i'm i'm quite wondering what i think there was a lot of interest in the whole thing where it's a new wave the club promoters realised, like you said earlier, they thought, oh, we can get on this. We can pack a night out. Uh, but a lot of the club promoters we come across were into it, into the, that whole thing. They weren't just doing yeah. it to capitalise. They were no, really absolutely. about, I remember Scratch and um, the Breaking Bread lot. We did loads of stuff with, with them and um, Funk and Pussy. I mean, all of those guys were DJs anyway that That's played right. these, this, you know, the various genres, whether it's hip hop or funk or anything, whatever else, and they were into it. So it's a passion. We knew it is that you know it wasn't just somebody wanting to cash in, but they knew okay, we're, we're passionate about this. We love this music. We're going to put on a night, and a lot of those nights were really successful. You know, I remember um, one of the scratch. They booked the Scala in it off near King's Cross. King's Cross is right, yeah. I mean, which is a a really big club. I mean, you you'd have to have a successful night to be able to book that. And it was packed, you know, mm. with a few there. I mean, the, the pinnacle really was the people championships at around that time would booked out the Brixton Academy, you know, Ram. and even, I remember Hooch even talking about this and he said, you know, when we first approached the Brixton Academy to, to put on this event there, the, the owners of the building said, you won't fill this, this event, this venue with this type of event. And we proved them wrong because mm. they were getting 5,000 people, to watch break dancing, b yeah. it, it was, and it was like, it was a shock to everyone how packed, you know, you'd have a mainstream artist pack that place out, someone like Madonna, you know, and we, they were getting the same audience for yeah. a break, a b-boy competition. It, it was quite incredible, you know, how, how um, popular it became. And a lot of the people attending these nights, these events, they weren't like hardcore hip hop purists. They were kind of like your mainstreams, but found it fascinating you know, and you, 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 a lot of people, like these things, they say, like, oh, we've never seen this before. This is amazing. You know, they, they loved it. Oh, it, it really crossed yeah. over. It did around that time. Yeah, it did. Yeah. It did. And off the back of those bigger established coveted uh, events, you then you then had, and this, this kind of correlates with the conversation I, ha I had with Tony, because... Um, he said in in the you know the the cubby holes of like I don't know out of out of town clubs that saw what happened in those massive staged events, you you guys had to almost adapt a little. And Tony said that you know the the circle even for you guys to start breaking was could sometimes be like you know no bigger than your arm span, but but that. <laughs> and he said that when there was other breaking crews or break dancers jumping in, you could, a bit like a boxer, you could almost tell just by the way they walked into a small space like that, whether they had their chops up. It's, it's true. It's, you get used to, like you said, the small circles. I mean, I'm a big bloke, 
but you kind of get used to navigating the small circle constantly we were trying to get the crowd to, to go backwards as well just to give us a bit more room but often when i come out and i was just about to wimble they would just get back anyway because they were going to get bloody booted <laughs> <and big leg. laughs> but, but no you, you kind of um when you when we used to do a lot of these clubs you get used to the small circles you get used to the adverse conditions which is poor flooring you know wet floors that kind of thing um uneven floors confined spaces you name it and we still managed to to pull it off in one way or the other in these what tr- tricky conditions but we just got used to it you know mm-hmm. it was um you get very very bust when you're going literally every week we were going to these places doing these shows or or throw down sessions and we just get good at it, it but you get sometimes you get other breakers where they're not quite used to it in the same mm-hmm. way that we and sometimes they would they fold basically they couldn't handle the floors or the or the confined space or that kind of thing you know but sometimes but yeah, there was also the thing that we you benefit from those environments is it's the intensity of, of the kind of um it's the energy of the whole thing. You know, you've got this packed environment, it's it's loads of people there, it's it's sweaty, it's hot, it's um, you know, the music's loud, it's it's intense, you know, and it kind of fires you up to kind of, you know, do your to do more than you would normally do. I mean, we used to get out of the car. Sometimes we've just driven three hours to get to somewhere. We come out of the car just stiff as boards, you know, knackered like you would feel after getting there. It's like bang, adrenaline's up, we'd be flying, you know. Sometimes straight out of the car, straight onto the stage in some situations, still kill it off, still pull it off, you know. But it's just you just get used to it. Yeah. It's but those so, soldier it, mentality, isn't it? It's soldier mentality. Yeah. We noticed it it really the when you know when it's like anything, when you get on the you can get addicted to it, can't you? The adrenaline. But when you get on a stage somewhere or in, a, in front of people, or it's on the floor in the circle, it, it pushes you that bit further than you would say if you're just behind closed doors. Mm. So all those years of training kicked in where we would just fly, you know, and we'd just be on fire. Um, and making it look easy, you it clearly wasn't. But when you're, you know, all those different adversities of like, you know, the variables of what. What on earth are we going to get ourselves into when we open these double doors into this club? You know, like, like yeah, of course, adrenaline kicks in. But when you when you're able to make it look effortless, you know, you, you of course, you're going to get the attraction of other competitors kind of thinking they can just slide on in as if it's like, you know, just a, it's nothing. <laughs> it's not. That's the thing. It, it looks effortless because to us it is effortless because we've trained and trained and trained it so, so we can do it in our sleep. Whereas to someone else, it's, it's next to impossible. It's it's like um. That's how it is, like with anything. If it's you've got a martial artist who does all these moves, you know, to them it's effortless because they've trained that for years. And it was the same with us. We trained these moves um for years. I mean, by about 2004, uh, when we were kind of probably peaking, we'd been breaking for 20 years, you know, mm. longer than most athletes' careers are, you know. Mm. You, like an Olympic gymnast, they don't do their thing for 20 years. You know, they might do it for 10 and stop and retire. But we we were going 20 years and we'd done it solidly in that time. So we'd those moves that we make in the effortless, those head spins or the or you know, everything else, we'd done that to a, to a, literally thousands of times, you know, it was pretty ridiculous how many times we trained that, and that's why it looked effortless. But to someone else, they go try it, no chance. No know? chance, bro. <laughs> Absolutely. I believe we, we all had a go. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and the thing is, it's funny what we'd see happen is somebody like you say these drunk blokes would say, "Oh yeah, yeah, Matt, I'll see. I'm gonna have a go at that." Do Hold my pint. I'm going in, kind of thing. They'd are, they'd half kill themselves. They'd like um because where they're pumped up with the adrenaline of being in front of people and they're obviously doing it more courageously than they would normally. They just jump and 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 they go, "Are you, are you just gonna do his back in?" And people would. They were like, "Oh mate, I can, I'm, I'm really injured," you know. I, I think I've seen situations where somebody's trying to do a backflip or something like that, and they they fall on the on their heads or something, and it's like God, they're, they're going to break their necks because they're kind of <laughs> pumped up with the with the alcohol and with the adrenaline and with the, the whole enthusiasm of the thing, and they're going out there. Or maybe another thing you get is somebody that would have done it, say back in the eighties for a little yeah. bit, maybe had a few moves, they could do a windmill, goes out, not done it in ten years, done it fifteen years, and, you know, and tries to do a windmill. Instant like, regret. Well, they, they they literally can't walk. You know, I've had such, I've known people that have gone out, done it. And I go, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely. And one guy couldn't. I did it. Couldn't walk for two days. He was just. He ripped his body up so much because the body's completely out of condition. 
Mm. Whereas he might still have the skill to do these moves, but pushing himself in that environment, they just they just do themselves in. Because if you don't train break him, and but you still got the moves, that's the most dangerous point because you can still do it, but your body's completely out of condition. I know I was telling you one, if, if they've not done it in ages, you've got to go easy and you've got to get yourself back on it. Even if I, you know, I, I had a little accident a month ago where I sort of um, hurt my back. Nothing to do with breaking, but I, I didn't break for about three or four weeks. Right. And getting the, the, this, this um, injury going. But when I got back into it, which was a few weeks ago, I took it very gen- gentle, even though I've done it for years, still took mm. it gentle because I feel my body even with a month out, was out of condition. So I had to go go easy. But you get these guys, and they've not done it in 15 years, just go mental. Next thing you know, they, they, they've ripped themselves up. They've, they've done their backs. They've done this. They've done their groins, you know, and because the body's not used to it. Breaking is brutal on the body, but you've got to constantly do it to keep it tough, tough, to toughen up to it. Yeah. And if you don't, and you go out there, you're going to, that's what they do. They're all drunk. They kept trying to do head spins. They do the neck in. They try to do a windmill. They they beat themselves up black and blue. They do the backs in. They do the groins. They've tried, you name it. They try it, and they just like the worm. You know, they beat themselves up. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's always funny to watch, but you know what they're doing. They're just going to kill themselves. Yeah, I guess you kind of with open arms, just like invite because you did. There's no stopping these people. You know, they you know they get a bit of Dutch courage, and next thing, yeah. oh, it's not yeah. my job. To stop them. Yeah, no. So they want to go out and stop to them, isn't it? I'm not going to say no, mate. You better not. You know, it's their choice. It's so funny. It's so funny. The human psyche of it all, isn't it? It's so funny. Yeah. Um, well, look, I need to talk about you, right? And the personalities within the crew. Yeah. But, but you know, we, we're, we're talking of a sizable team. And there are a few, in my, uh, to my mind, legendary figures particularly in the crew you were one of them like the name junk like junk in itself i mean it sounds like a graph name it sounds like it is a graph name. it is a graph name yeah and there's a a story behind it actually okay um people have asked me why junk well there's a bit of a story in the in the 87 i was einstein was my graffiti name because I was always quite into science and all that kind of stuff. So I cho- chose the name Einstein. But the trouble is, is when I go to pizza on the wall, I used to get to the last couple of letters on that space because it's such a long name. I think, yeah. is it eight or seven letters? And I said to Nick one day, it was eight, 87 this was, and I said, look, I, I'm, get, I'm trouble with this Einstein name. It's too long. I've, I struggle to fill it on walls. I'm always running out of space. It's a lot of paint, but bro. <laughs> I need another name. I need something about four or five letters long, um, something snappy and just, that's quicker to do. And he just said junk. I said, that'd do. And that, and I kept it <laughs> ever since, but I found the word junk was very easy to piece on a wall, not because it's four letters, but somehow the, 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 the J and the U, it all seems to fit together really nicely. Like when I do mm. a tag, each letter, and what I like to think with graffiti is how the letters fit together when you, they kind of flow into each other. And I always found that those combination of letters, J, U, N, K, they fit really well together when you're doing an outline or a tag. Mm-hmm. So it was, I just, and I just did loads of junk pieces and found that it was a really good word to, um, to piece for that. It was short. It worked really well on walls. It fitted together. It they were easy letters to do. And it worked very well, much easier than Einstein. Mm-hmm. So that I kept that name for then, but then I got into, um, I mean, I adopted it then. In, in other words, I just used the name for everything rather than having like a, a b-boy name or a graffiti name or a DJ name. You have all different names, which just confuses people. Just keep the same name. It's like branding, isn't it? So I just kept, okay, junk for the lot. It, and, that, and that is, so it stuck from there. It was from graffiti. And um, then I got into DJing in like sort of 88. And I started doing mixtapes and then later records. And I thought, okay, I'll use it for that, mm. you know. Use it for as, as for for the breaking. So it's just, and and the other thing is, because I kept that name all the way through, and because back in the early ages, you keep changing names every five minutes. But mm. the thing I realised is that well, your name is your branding, isn't it? So if you keep changing your name, people are never going to know who you are because your name's constantly changed. But you keep the same name and you keep reinforcing that name, then it just gets more and more known, doesn't it? Mm. So that's 
the philosophy behind it. So it's just that was the reason for the name. Funny though, I'm not that keen on the name to be honest. But it's, it's like the coolest. It's the coolest fucking name, bro. And I also think there's an authenticity to to this name because you know it, it throws up questions like, well, what is it like? But it's you, and you can tell the fault lines do lie. Like I said, I I just had an inkling it was graph related, and that's the authentic. Yeah, right. That's do you know what I mean? That's the authenticity that you want out of somebody that's within the, the arena of hip hop, right? Yeah. It's, it's rare. It's rare. Um, and, you know, I think hip hop brings out the challenge of being creative by any means necessary against all limits, against any. Yeah. Do you know That's what I'm saying? You're doing your art form with limited resources yeah. And you're doing it where with a lot of resistance as well. We felt that with the breaking where, you know, in the early 80s, a lot of people did, did, didn't did approve of you breaking, you know. You, you can get it from your friends and family. You know, oh, you're still doing that stupid dancing for you, you know, that kind of thing. And then also the lack of like places to train. The amount of times we got thrown out of places where we'd sort of like, we weren't just welcome, you know, for mm. youth clubs and this and that and discos and nightclubs or public spaces or we'd sneak in places and get thrown out. Um, so you, get, you had all this resistance just for breaking. Um, graffiti art, you know, it was another one. It was like a lot of it was illegal to do, mm. you know, um, that you had to nick the paint because you couldn't afford the paint. So you are doing all of this on limited resources. That's what the art of it is, isn't it? It is mm. the, you know, you've not got like super high budget to, to pay for a fancy studio or, or this or that, but you do it anyway. We used to, like, often we, we have nowhere to break, so we get a better liner and go in the park or shopping arcade. We still did it. All, all the same, you know, we weren't going to be stopped. So that is it. It's doing it on limited resources. And I think that in a way that that makes it better because you're more determined to do it, basically, yeah. whatever it is. If you, you you know, you become a DJ. When I started DJ, I didn't have uh, money to buy the turntables or anything. You know, you scrape that together. You scrape mm. the money to get records together. You know, mm. that kind of thing. And you do it anyway. You know, I remember going out, when I started doing mixtapes, be honest, I used to rob the mix. I used to rob the, the blank tapes just to do mixtapes and sell them, you know. And then the money made from that, I'll buy more records with. So it was like you literally did this on, you know, however you could really, but you did it anyway. It's the truest. It's the truest art form. And like like you yeah. say, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, it's a cheap to enter art form, right? Um, it is just well, gotta be whole, fucking good. Well, that was the whole idea with the Bronx Kids, wasn't it? it was hip hop was like um, they literally were poor, so they could dance on a bit of cardboard in their, I don't know, in their basketball court, mm. or, or or they could do a block party with, you know, they couldn't, didn't have the money to, to, you know, have fancy musical instruments, but they could just rap with a couple of turntables. That was the idea. It was mm. doing it. Like in the hip-hop history movie, it was doing it with limited resources, but it, they did, you know, they did it really well. Just on mm. a couple of turntables, a couple of records, and a mixer and a mic and a mean yeah. brilliant yeah so they they that's how it is but also the physical and you've mentioned this a couple of times already i mean you you're you're a tall lad yeah and uh, and you're working within i wouldn't even call that a restriction to be fair like the amount of times i i lose count of how many times i've seen you guys perform and every time it's a different experience but one thing holds incredibly true to every single show is the, the the moment Junk walks out into the circle, everyone just looks up and thinks, oh, oh fuck. Do you know what, it's, it's what I always found? Was, I find this quite amusing, actually. And it's the funny thing is, when I first started breaking, I was I was a bit gutted that I was big. I was like, oh, I really want to be one of these small guys because you know they, they find it so much easier. Well, actually, I got to learn to appreciate being big because it, mm. it was more shocking for people that I was a big, because not many breakers are bigger than me or even my size and, and still good. There were very, very few. Most of them are, are small. And um, but I'd come out and people were like, first of all, they're like, what the fuck's this guy gonna do? Yeah, totally. Who is this bloke? You know what I mean? And it was almost like they were almost kind of intrigued as to like because I didn't look like a typical breaker, being right. the size that I am. Um, and then I'd come out and smash it. I remember at the Urban Games, it was like, I mean, even a guy that I know said this because he was in the audience when he first saw me, and he goes, I saw you come out, and he's like, Who's this guy? What's he gonna do? But it's and your you demeanor get, as well, bro. Absolutely. Like you didn't, you didn't. It, it, it almost kind of mirrored from a crew point of view. It like, almost like a secret weapon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wasn't the best. Must admit, you know, in our crew, 
I never claimed to be the best. I think the best really were were Nick and a- Nick and Asa. They were the absolute best. I mean, I w- I think I was right. in the middle somewhere. But I found the reaction I got from my size was just like people were just dumbstruck, you know. And like this guy said when I did Urban Games, I mean, I smashed that Urban Games until I remember that. Yeah, I remember and. That. Um, People, first, the guy said, because we couldn't believe it when you started breaking. Be, but at first it was like, who is this guy? You know what I mean? He's like, mm-hmm. he's like massive, you know, what's he going to do? And so it was a, it did surprise people. And I realized then my, my actual size wasn't, was an asset in a way, because it was, um, it, it had more impact. You know, when you see a child breaking or you see someone really small breaking, even though they can be really good, it doesn't quite have the same impact same ferocity as then someone's bigger for some reason and so even though i might find it a lot harder to do the moves it, it's i was just bigger so it had like a big person doing a really fast windmill some it's somehow more startling than a small person but it's also relate bro, bro it's also relatable because again just going back to the whole your demeanor you you it, it kind of it was almost like well that guy's doing it like and and he, you know, not everyone was tall, like you say. But when yeah. you when you've got break dancers, a lot in a lot of cases, you can you you see the the fault lines of your of of you know what you would get in a brochure of break dancers. You know, you were out of the brochure. Exactly. Yeah. People my size didn't do it. It's just one of those things. Tall, big guy. Not only was I tall, I wasn't really skinny either. I was quite stocky and big, heavy. I mean, I'm 15 stone now, and I still can do really good windmills. But um, people my size just didn't do breaking. It was just a little, really small. I remember all the people I knew that did it that were kind of they were short for starters, mm. quite sort of like. And the other thing that characters that there is often small legs because my mm. legs are long. Whereas a lot of breakers who were really good, they kind of had quite small legs relative to their torso. And that actually puts you in adv- an advantage for doing breaking because. You, your lower half is much lighter than your top half, and it's a lot easier to do flares and things like that. You know, whereas I would I have big legs, so for me, breaking wasn't the ideal activity for me to do. I'd have been better off, I don't know, being a rugby player or something like that. You know, so, um, but I did it anyway because I just trained really hard. But it just shows you if you if you train, you know, when people say, "Oh, I'm too old for that," "I'm too big for that," "I'm too fat for that," whatever, I just say bollocks because yeah, you've already lost, yeah. You know, because I, I'm, you know, I'm old, I'm big, I'm not fat, but I'm not s- small either. But there are fat guys who break, and you know, there's an, there's an Asian guy who's really, really big. He does air tracks a lot. It just shows you, it's just, it's just all in your head. You know, um, it, you, you put your own limitations on yourself, saying you can't do something. If you tr- put your mind to it, you can do it. So I was proof of that that big people can break and break well if you put in the effort, but you need to work at it. You know, and I've trained really hard. I'm talking fanatical to get to get there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and with with limitations comes that creativity that I think you know drives the drives the momentum forward. Um, what were the what were the you mentioned having you know stronger, bigger legs, uh, torso down? Like what what other things would you say were contributive to you? creating your own style within the restrictions that you had? I think that just a thing for me is the dedication because a lot of people, if they're natural at something, they don't appreciate it, but they're not very dedicated. Mm. Like I, like kids I was growing up with or kids from school, whatever, or other breakers where you, you could see that they had it. They had that sort of natural ability and they could have been really amazing, but they weren't that bothered about it for somebody that didn't value that. And they're kind mm. of more, I don't know, going down the pub with their mates or or something else they weren't really into breaking and i used to think so oh god if i was like them i'd be amazing but i wasn't but the, the thing that i did have is i was had the desire to to get good at breaking so i had that dedication where i would just do it every single day and you Whereas, had the power you had power for days well, well first when i first started breaking i was really unathletic i was big I wasn't particularly fit or anything like that. I never liked sports as a, as a kid. So I was kind of like a bit out of shape, a bit podgy maybe even. But the the thing that where I just trained really hard, I eventually got fit. You know, I got kind of like strong and athletic. And for just for the sheer volume of training, I mean, talking this is a ridiculous amount of training where 
every day it was hours and hours and hours it was like you know mm. so it was for me what got me there was the dedication to it i had to struggle to get all of the stuff but it was i just did it so much and we all did i mean it wasn't just me we all of us trained really hard you know mm. through the 80s and the 90s we were doing it hours every day and it's that de- dedication i've not seen that dedication like what we had i've, I've rarely seen it in anyone else since you know mm. i'm some you know guys have come up in breaking have done done well but there's very few that have got that overwhelming dedication you know i've trained a lot of people and they, they i say how many times do you break it's our oh, three times a week it you know we break every bloody night you know it's it is and then and then when they train they might train an hour we used to train five hours a night it, it's like five hours a night yeah, more than that i mean i remember me and asa now to europe we were living in a van in Germany in the mid nineties, and we would break all day, every day, and all night. We would break literally; our bodies nearly fell apart. It was ridiculous. It was, we would think nothing of just breaking eight hours a day. Yeah, all the time. It was mental. Um, yeah, but that's how people were just obsessed by it. Um, remember me and Tony when we were getting our head spins in eight, eighty six. We used to do lock ins. You know, um, my parents had a bar um, in the basement bar. We would go down there. And I remember me and Tony there, Boxing Day of 1986. We're there all day, all day long, just practicing. Wow. Coaching. Just literally all day. We went home. We went back and had some dinner. Tony went home, had some tea and come back. And we did the same thing all that evening. I love that. While, while everyone was out in the sales, you were out doing windmills. <laughs> yeah, that's what we used to do. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> we were just mad, mad for it to the point where it was almost a, a, an obsessive level. Mm. But it was... It was that dedication to it that got us to that level. There's no other way about it because the, the level that we got to, say, by mid-90s was so high that it was only just for the sheer volume of training. And that is the thing with breaking. To get good at this, you've got to train like there's no tomorrow. It's one of those things. If you mm. don't, you're not that good. It's just, you know, you can't fake it. It's not other things where you can fake it. Breaking, there's no faking it. You've got to train really, really hard to get there and that's what we exactly what we did but we loved it so that's yeah. the other thing so it's all right um i'm going to come back around to that uh dedication but uh going back to what you were saying about the crew in its in its in its totality you you all the some of the parts and i think wherever there may have been what could only be described i guess as a weakness quote unquote on one person the dedication between all of you and this constant um from what looked how it looked as as a spectator in the audience it was it it really there didn't seem any like there was any ego it was just like you guys were a unit well oiled machine well that was it we were exactly that we're like a, an army an, an army group that's trained their operation over and over against what they do in the army isn't there they mm. train the same thing or martial artists you know like like if you ever done any any martial arts you train the same thing endlessly to the point where you're bored shitless of it but that's what we did you know we just did that that thing breaking we did it every day it's, it's something for us like when we're going to turn up at a, a club and somebody's not seen us before but that's what we do every day you know mm. we're just in a different place but we're doing exactly the same as what we do every other day so it we were just obsessed by it um and we would just do it all the time you know it wasn't like okay we're breaking like i don't know monday night then we're gonna break thursday night and i said no we break seven nights a week i remember for that time seven nights a week and sometimes it was a lot of hours each night some Man. sometimes you'd go and train and your body would be so knackered that you couldn't really do much you know you, you'd just get overly fatigued but a lot of the time it was like um you know, we we just break and break and break and break, and it was just insane how much we break. Um, that's, it was that's... Lifestyle. for me. It was it was the most dominant thing in my lifestyle at that age because I remember when I was eighteen. I mean, um, I didn't have a girlfriend, didn't really have a job or anything. Mm. Really, do the things that other people do. Like I don't know, didn't, I didn't drive. I didn't have a car. You know, a lot of lads at that age they have a girlfriend, they've got a car. And we'd go down the pub with their mates and that kind of thing. No, that wasn't for me. No. I didn't have any of those things. I just braked. I remember on a Friday night, um, you know, 18 or 19, just find myself in a dance studio somewhere on a Friday night. Everyone else going out 
partying. I've just been in the dance studio, just doing doing my parts on breaking yeah. on my own a lot of the times, just doing that. That's what I used to do. You know, I, I wasn't. Everyone else had different lifestyles, but for me, breaking was a lifestyle. It was just obsessive, really. Yeah, yeah. And when something's that obsessive, habitual, I mean, the the, the, the word madness springs to mind but if you know you're mad then that makes you dangerous right yeah well i think i don't think i'm mad i'm eccentric but I'm, i've got my faculties when it comes to my brain but for me i i think from what definitely drove me with break because breaking makes you feel a certain way you see when you a lot of people that don't break don't understand this, this is why i still break now when you do breaking you feel um you feel a, a, a kind of a it's very therapeutic. It's it's but it's like your body feels brilliant after breaking. You feel like it gets rid of all the um and it makes you ache. It makes you ache in a good way, but it gets rid of that fatigue. It makes you feel really, really good. The stretching out you get, but also the kind of mental um feeling you get from breaking as well. It's it's actually addictive because it's like you know, you get people that are, are exercise junkies that yeah. go to the gym every day. It's the same thing. And i I would definitely say that you get addicted to it where you you kind of you know what? I I I used to, I remember in the 90s, girlfriends used to get pissed off for me because I'm always breaking every single night. And they, and they used to say, well, can't you, you know, why are you doing everything? They couldn't understand it. If I didn't do it, I was almost climbing the wall. It was almost like an alcoholic who hasn't had his drink. Oh, yeah. you know, it was like the same thing. You know, there's someone that's really into weed, doesn't get their joint when they get home. And you're kind of irritable. And that for me, it was breaking was that, where it was like, I had to just go and do it. It was almost like, you know, oh, I just want to do a few moments. I just want to feel that sort of loosen up. I want to feel... And I get it now. Even I don't break as much. I train twice a week, but I still have this need where I just kind of need to break because it's the feeling it gives you, the, the stretching out of your body and everything else. Obsessive. It, it, feels, it feels really good. So it's kind of like I do it for that reason. I almost like wonder how people can go by without it. It's 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 that kind of thing. And they, you say they say this for a lot of people that do extreme exercise. Remember, I used to train karate with the bloke years ago, and he was saying to me, he "Goes oh, you know, when you first start doing this, it's really hard." But when you eventually it gets into your blood and you can't let it go. Mm. And I remember that guy telling me that. He was like a second Dan Black Belt. And I oh I didn't follow into the karate thing the same way, although I had a go. But I did with the breaking thing. So I'd have been a second Dan at breaking. It would be the same thing. But it gets into your blood and you can't it's like you even though you know you get these guys in their sixties and they still go to the karate training and do it all. But it's like they can't let it go. I mean, even I'm I'm Schwarzenegger still weight trains now he's like mm. 70 old. he still weight trains because he can't imagine a life not weight training so for him it's the same thing where you've got you just got to do it and for me breaking's that i'll probably be breaking at 74 like he's still weight training you know what i mean yeah. um that's how i say it it's, it's something that just get, gets into you and you can't let it go um it's definitely an addiction for sure well for the for and obsessiveness i mean you know is there is there a compulsive obsessive within you that that sees this um, as as a trait. I'm very obsessive with everything. Yeah, right. I am totally obsessive. Um, I'm not a mediocre person in the way that I just. A lot of people would do something. They dabble. When I do something, I take it to the extreme. To to it, to, it's almost like, uh, in a way, I kind of create trouble for myself because I do stuff too much and I do too many things. I almost like put myself under too much pressure to mm. to, to achieve. But I'm like this with a lot of things. I'm obsessive about not just breaking, but I'm I'm obsessive about other things too. But I do everything I do, I do do to an obsessive level. And I've been like even since I was a kid, I was like this. You know, um, whatever I did, I'd just be mad for it and just do it all the time. I would get really good at things though as a result because yeah. I think to excel at something, you have to be kind of obsessive, don't you? You know, anyone yeah. that's achieved greatness in anything. They've been obsessed by that thing, whatever that is, you know, and I'm definitely in that category with things. So, yeah, breaking is one totally obsessed by that. I've been obsessed by my music as well, you know, and other things too. So no, so no idle time. You you never have any idle time. You're always active doing I'm always to go. The only time I literally don't do anything is when I just completely warm myself out, you know. Uh, but part, even then, I'm still trying to have a go at something. But mm. I'm always doing something. It's always like um, I'm not one to just waste loads of time. You know, some people are just quite happy just to sit in front of the telly all day long and kind of just do nothing. Mm. I don't really do that. I'm always like um, I'm always up to something. I'm always doing music projects, you know, whatever, or I'm breaking. Um, 
I run a business as well. I'm always involved in that. There's always something going on. You know, it's 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 like this constant cycle of activity. So it's just the way I am because I can't. I'm not comfortable just sort of like. I feel like I'm wasting time for starters. If I just sat around, you know, if I spent all day just doing absolutely nothing, I just, I kind of feel like oh, I've wasted today. You know, it's like I could have done something constructive. The only time I do do that is if I'm ill or I've just completely done myself in because I've, you know, just pushed myself to an extreme. Or maybe I've been out partying and something completely, completely bollocks somewhere mm. in a club and come back and go, oh, I'm knackered, you know, that kind of I thing. I can't imagine junk being bollocks in a, in a club. I can't imagine that. You know something, right? I don't act like that, you know. I, I'm not. I'm not a teetotal or anything like that. Although I was, you know. Um, but I don't you can act- accept that that you 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 like a you know a drink and a, you know and a grin and you can you're totally at peace with that as a yeah, sports yeah. player. I'm, I'm 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 not excessive like some people are moderate, but I'm not you're not a purist. But the thing is for me is I don't I won't act ridiculous. You know I won't go out. And people say you know what you've had quite a few drinks, but you act exactly the same. I've got this somehow knack of just completely hiding it, of like, I can go out and, you know, I mean, me and my girlfriend, we went to Ibiza back in um, May and we were getting drunk every day, but people say, I said, I've been on drinking all day. I said, you don't look at it. I wouldn't act any different, complete. I wouldn't like become all boisterous or aggressive or stupid like some people do, completely act the same. I think that's a brilliant, I'm really thankful I'm like that because some people can get themselves into a lot of trouble, can't they? Yeah. You know, stop fights. I'd never do that. I'm just really calm, exactly the same. So, um, I can hide it really well. So, yeah, you won't see me like acting stupid because I'm pissed. Um, even though I might be pissed, I'll be just. And you know, the other funny thing is, I can still break when I'm pissed as well. Oh, and stop I can still eat it. Because people, people sometimes before a show, I'd have a few pints and say, "What are you drinking for for the show?" So, well, I actually think it makes me perform better for some because it relaxes. Wow. Yeah, and I do, and I, I DJ drunk as well and i do it really well it's there's something like, how the hell do you do that i remember me and um me and, me and nick and a few others we went to um we went to this uh southampton footballers party that was it a mate of ours knew some of the the southampton footballers and they had this swanky party in the swanky hotel mm. and um, you know there's all these dolly birds there, and there's all these like flash arries and you know and we got completely rat asked well, i mean properly gone what we, we look, you could oh, say oh, that junk junk Junk's a mess. Junk's a hot mess right now. You, you, you that people, you could we, clock it. No, no one knew, but we still pulled off the moves. We're still wow. pulling off headspins a lot. It what about next pissed. morning? What about hungover? Like, do you operate hungover? Well, do you know what? Funny you mentioned that. I have done. Well, I remember once in 2003 going to Cannes, south of France, for a TV mm-hmm. festival. Um, and there's a few other breakers there. Kevin was there. Anyway, it's a really good gig. But the first night we got there, we were on the beach, and this is Marquee, big Marquee, and it's a free bar. So they said, oh, there's a free bar, get yourself a drink. Because we all piled in there and just went mental and just helped ourselves to loads of booze. Completely pissed. The next right. day, we've woken up in the hotel. Oh, yeah, you've got, you've got a show at 9 a.m. Get yourself ready. We're like, fuck. Ed's banging. Got Went and did the show anyway, because you had to. And you know what? Hangover completely gone. So yeah, of course, because the adrenaline kicks in. It pushed it out. It's like the... Um, it creates a blood flow. This is what I'm saying about breaking. It's really therapeutic because when you don't feel too good, if you suddenly do breaking, it makes you feel better in a lot of situations. If you've got a headache, for example, if you're stressed out and you've had one of those days where you're just fucked off, basically, mm. with things, you know, you're knackered, whatever. I find that when you go breaking, it clears all that out. And even when you go turn up and you're knackered, like you could have a really busy day, and you're knackered, you still go breaking, you've pushed yourself to do it. Mm. It's like it pushes through all of that knackered feeling or that stress feeling, and it's really good for your body, and it's like it cleans out your body. And so hangover, yeah, it gets rid of that, all right. So, yeah, I've had loads of times I've been hungover, just gone breaking, felt perfectly fine afterwards. I mean, at least these are, I guess these are kind of layman's questions that I'm, I'm I'm diving into a bit here. But when you've got, when you're, when you're junk and your lifestyle is hip hop, is breaking, you know, these, are, like you say, it becomes an aid and uh, you don't lose any of the um, lessons learned or skills you've crafted over the course of 25 plus years, right? More than that. You know, you, you, you don't lose them easily. Do you know what I think? Um, being into breaking hip hop, I mean, that's not that's not the only thing I'm into as well. I'm into other things, but I think that the one thing I learned from breaking, the less, biggest lesson uh, is 
dedication to something gets you the success that you want and whatever that is. Because a lot of people don't achieve what they want to achieve in any field mm. because they're not dedicated enough and they, they give up too easily. Yeah. And the thing is, remember what I was saying about when in 84, I was a big lad, pretty af- unathletic. Breaking wasn't going to be my thing, but I persisted with it anyway and I got there because I was dedicated. But if you apply that discipline to other stuff, when it's going hard, when it's difficult, I mean, breaking for me was hard too. But when something's not going well, don't give up. And the, yeah. the, the thing that I see constantly over and over again is people give up stuff so easily and that's why they never get anywhere because they think they're always looking for the easy ride, right? They mm. start something, they oh, okay, that's going to be easy. I'm going to be really good at that. But the moment they hit an obstacle, it doesn't go there quite how it planned and they mm. get some difficulties. They're, they packed up, then they're starting something else. Well, nothing's going to do well if, you, if you've got that attitude. So the thing that I learned from breaking, and I've applied this to other stuff too, um, especially when it comes to business stuff as well, Keep going. Be determined. Just show dedication to something. And, and even when you get the setbacks or things don't go how you want them to, soldier on. Just keep going. And that's how you get success at anything. So it's that mindset. And I think it's done me really well because, you know, I've managed to do other things well over the years. So, But it, I got that from breaking because I learned that. Well, you know, I got good at breaking against the odds. I was big, heavy not very strong, not very athletic. And I still got good because I just bloody dedicated. You can apply that dedication to something else. Mm. You'll get the same results. Um, you'll do well at something else, whatever that is. But I see people, you know, they just give up so easily with stuff. You know, I, I, I've taught breaking. As students come along, try a couple of times. Oh, I can't get that. And you don't see them again. It's like, well, they've given up because they they've they not learned it in five minutes. Well, mm. I tell them it doesn't come in five minutes like anything. You know, you want to, whatever you want to be in life, you've got to work hard at it. And a lot of people, nothing is a lot of people see the success that someone's had, but they don't see the work that's gone into it. Like they might see us lot, oh yeah, second night amazing, but they've not seen the, the 15 years that we trained every bloody night. Yeah, yeah. And they, don't see uh, we, they, they can do that too, but you've got to put in the work. And that's, I don't think, happens. I don't think you guys see it neither because it's so habitual. I was talking to Torch, uh, German, uh, MC. Yeah, I've heard of Torch, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. Um, and all 360 encompassing, you know, the culture. Um, you know, he he said, you know, I, he he could be on stage, Splash Festival, Germany, God knows how many lights, cameras, audience, da 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 da. Um, that's not the buzz for him. The, the 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 it's it's as important that he goes home and does a you know a sketch or um does a freestyle or listen to some breaks or that that contributive side to the culture is as important to him in cutting his chops as the big lights cameras action. That's how it should be. You should do it for art's sake, for the art's sake, not for the adulation. Mm. And that's why we, we did breaking because we weren't breaking like, cause we want to be on stage and be on TV or you name it. Mm. We didn't even ever imagine that would happen. We did it cause we loved it. And if you do something cause you love it, the success comes anyway. But if you're doing it only for success, because you want to be famous, you want to get paid then you're not really going to do well because you, you don't love the art. So you've got mm. to do it, like you say, Torch got, does a, does outlines anyway. It's it's a case of you do it because you have to do it. You, you you know, like that's how it's got to be. You you know, I do music, but I, I just sometimes just do it because I want to. You know, it's not a case of like, oh, I want to make a hit or anything like that or get paid. No, you do it because you, you want to do it. But then if you have that mentality, we do love something, success follows, I think, mm. a lot of like it did for us with the breaking you know when i started breaking 1984 i never imagined that i'd be on tv doing it or even get paid mm. you know that, that all happened but it didn't happen because that's what our objective was it happened because we just loved doing what we did mm. and whether we on you know whether we got gigs or not or on telly or not we would still done it and that's how you have to be with, with anything you have you love the art form and then the success comes anyway and that's how it is so torch is in the same boat as we are you know mm. that kind of thing i love it i love it I love, and i love talking to characters like yourself because you're the, the pedigree yeah, there we are, pedigree of that that mindset and um when you've when you've got characters like yourselves and whether it's you know from a fan point of view like myself people that are in the culture even your contemporaries you know when you see you guys second to none still doing it it's like an okay sign. Like it's, um, 
I know what you mean. It, it makes it okay for others to think, okay, I'm 48 now. I want to do break dancing or b-boying. Yeah. Uh, these guys are in their 50s. They're doing it. Yeah, it's, it's fine for me because yeah. there's this thing. You know, I was talking about how in the late 80s, everyone gave up breaking. But a lot of people kind of felt they're almost too old. Like, mm. oh, I shouldn't be doing that now because I'm now 20. I shouldn't be doing that anymore. People used to say to me, oh, you know, years ago, oh, you're 22. You sh- aren't you too old to be doing that now? That, that, isn't that for kids? <laughs> Yeah, you right. know, and that yeah. is the mindset. It's like, no, I don't see myself as too old for bloody anything. It's like, well, if you think I'm too old, I don't give a shit what you think. And I've had people, you know, question this. Oh, were not you too old to that? I said, no, if I could still do it. Is there a law against it? No. Look, if you want to do something, do it. If you can do it, do it. If it's not illegal, you're not going to get arrested for it, do it. It's it's a case of, yeah, I, I, I want to do it. It's um, But there's this thing, you know, we are validating that it is okay to be older and do this and i've come yep. across people say i say oh you don't, don't you do that like, oh no i'm too old for that i said well you're you're younger than me and i still do it so that's bollocks you know yeah. <laughs> it, it's just in your head you know um but a lot of people feel somehow that when they get to when they grow up a, get a bit older get past 40 or whatever the age is they feel oh i shouldn't be into that anymore you know I've got, i'm now a father i'm now a company director i'm now a husband i'm now i don't know i'm now got a a high paying job you know i need to start acting like a dog oh i need to let that stuff go that, why yeah why do you have to why you know what I mean? yeah. it's like if you still like it don't get rid of your records don't stop doing something if you like it because you you will regret it if it, if you really like something you will regret it and i know people have done this they give up you know and they see us lots they're like oh you like, still doing that's amazing oh i gave up years ago and oh i really miss it you know and yeah. put it all before so you, I think it's important to keep going with something, you know. I could, for me, it would break my heart to to give up breaking. Of course, it would break you know, our it, hearts. It would break our hearts, my brother. It would. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to know we've pushed. And do you know something? I mean, me, me and Nick, we still train. I mean, Tony trains, he, although he's not. Really, he, Tony has a difficult bit of a difficult lifestyle situation, which I won't go into, but because it's private. But anyway, he he does come training. He really loves it when he does come training. And mm. um, but me and Nick. We are the ones that are most kind of available to train because we are we are self employed for starters. We don't have kids. Well, Nick's got an adult son, but we don't mm-hmm. actually look after young children. So yeah, I don't. Yeah. And so we we are more available to break, and we train. We try and train quite regular. Sometimes there's th- things that do interrupt it, but we always make a point of training twice a week. And um, we just think we just want to keep this going. But if say um, something got in the way. Like if, it, if Seth got injured, for example, and I couldn't break, mm. then would I it would drive me mad, you know, because I would really miss it, and I would feel um, that kind of feeling, you know, like somebody's got divorced, you know, like that kind of thing, or, mm. or whatever, or where they felt, oh, that part of my life is now behind me, or when someone dies, that kind of thing. Um, I'd feel that with breaking, even though breaking isn't a person, or, or it's it, it's a, it's been a big part. Look, I've been breaking forty years nearly, and I'm. In fifty four, so I've been breaking three quarters of the life, the time that I've been alive. Incredible, yeah. So it'd be, for me to give it up, I would feel like you know my partner's just died, or my kids mm. have just died, or or something like that. It would be the same kind of feeling to, to have to actually stop it. So yeah. for me, I just can't let it go. And just to just to really ram home the, the dedication I've got to breaking, I actually built my own dance studio to, to be able to do it in <laughs> because. I was sick. Yes, sick of incredible. Sick of for years of um, of of always struggling to get places to train. You know, you said that we used, we used to train outside a lot, like in parks and in the cold. Look, when you get older, you don't really want to do that. You want to be a bit more comfortable. So, um, one thing that I always wanted. I mean, my parents had a bar, which was good because we could train down there. Um, even though my dad used to get a bit pissed off about it all the time because we'd be tra- training when the customers would come in, you know, oh, you lot come pack up, you know. Um, Amazing. You know, they didn't seem to mind. But the, the thing was, my parents didn't have the bar from 94 onwards. So for, for there was a period of time where we struggled to get places, you know, we used to try and hire dance studios and it's always a bit awkward and it was always inconvenient. So the one thing that I thought, you know what, I, I've always wanted my own place. And um, in 2007, I bought, bought a house with this massive bit of land next to it and i thought so you know what i'm going to do i'm going to make a platform to break in so i built this platform and in the in, in the garden it was like a wooden platform built out of ply, plywood and, and timber so 
in the summer we put a liner out and we'd be breaking in it and it's great but then the, the autumn come I thought oh we can't do it anymore we, we you know and I thought you know what I'm going to build walls and a ceiling to this so thing. good and so I built this dance hut uh, all out of timber and I had a bit of hassle from the planning people as well because I didn't realise that it would actually contravene the planning laws. So then I had the council breathing on my neck and eventually I managed to get it passed as legitimate under what's called permit development. So it had to comply with certain conditions. And anyway, they came around and said, that was fine, we, we're passing this now. You can oh. you can keep your dance studio. And um, I can only use it as a dance studio. I can't use it as a residential accommodation because that would mean I'd have to get a planning application. Anyway, so what I still use that now me and Nick use that and Tony comes around I have other guys come around and we train in that all the time so I can go there any time and train a day or night I could get an hour for what I do and it doesn't cost wow. me anything either so I've got my own little dance studio and it's quite big it's um it's five meters by four meters it's got a good sound system it's got little lights so it's all like a little like little spotlights in there it's all like so cozy. good and it's great I love it we put a bit like we got we got um a sofa on one, we've got a couple of sofas, we've got these little lights, we've got a booming sound system. And what I do with the other guys at Break, there's a few other guys who in our local area at Break, I let them go in there any time and train even when I'm not there. So they, they, I say to them, look, as long as you pack it all up, turn it off, whatever, but you go in there. And so sometimes they might just go in there like whenever they want to. So I kind of make it like open for the other guys. There's just oh. some younger guys that train, but I make oh, it available good. for them because I'm I know how much of a struggle it is to to get places to train, and they really appreciate it. And sometimes I've had a, about a month ago, some guys from London came down with, and we all went to this the hut, and we had a big session there. And I I came along, and these other guys came down, and it, we had a full on. There's about eight of us down there. We've had fifteen people in it at one point, um, but people come and go. So, but we have this. I've got this hut. And for me, it's a, it's enabled us to carry on breaking because you know what? Sometimes the struggle of getting a good place to train is is just outweighs the benefit, and it's um, it's just a hassle sometimes. So that's been a godsend. So I want to keep that hot going. Um, you know, I, I've got a few repairs to do to it yet, and things like that. But I want to just do that. So that that hut has been my baby. You know, yeah. Incredible. See, Viva the second to none, bringing him through. Still going, below the radar, and just full on. It's exactly what I wanted in this episode to know that business as usual. Junk man, thank you so much for joining You're us welcome. on the podcast, my brother. Yeah, nice one. Thanks for having me. Incredible, incredible conversation. I'm just going kind to of be walking away, dissolving all of that in my head, thinking like that. <laughs> Lots to look forward to. Nothing to complain about, and everyone look forward at. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Junk. Yep, Killer Keller Podcast doing it once again. Doing it yep. once again. If that ain't enough intel for you, there's another 500 podcasts in the bank, all right? Killer Keller Podcast. Thank you so much, Junk. Yeah, like it was out of fashion. Uh, you stay lucky, people. Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't, yeah? Take care. Easy. Bye-bye, then. Bye. Bye. Bye.